All right, anyone, everyone, welcome to this IEEE GRSS panel uh, on remote sensing and sustainability. Um, we just at the beginning, I want like to tell everyone that we are starting a new technical committee uh, called Remote Sensing of Environment, uh, Climate Analysis, and Climate Technologies. So the acronym is React. It's a little contrived, but I think React is kind of a good acronym that we'd like to keep. Um, the technical committee is about um, using remote sensing to promote sustainability and um, everyone should join. I'll, uh, you know, I'll put an email list if you want kind of, uh, you know, emails from that technical committee. It's going to start next year, but we want everyone to kind of sign up now so that when it starts, we can ask everyone to kind of become members of the technical committee. And there's also other GRSS technical committees uh, that you can find on the GRSS website. Um, the moderator today is uh, Cooper Ellsworth. Um, most recently, he was the product manager for sustainability at uh, Descartes Labs. Uh, and, you know, I'm very kind of, you know, it's great to kind of see everyone here. And with that, uh, Mike to Cooper. Great. Thanks, Subit. And thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, Today, we're hearing from a bunch of really awesome people in the sustainability space, um, thinking about how to use remote sensing for ongoing sustainability solutions. Uh, we tried really hard to bring in folks from kind of, you know, broadly across the space. Um, so we have Caitlin Contis, who's the head of science at Impact Observatory, Dan Hammer, a managing partner at Earthrise Media, Imbal Backer Rashef, a program director at NASA Harvest, and Joe Morrison, VP of Commercial Product at Umbra. And right now is a really exciting space, a really, really exciting time for sustainability, both from the regulatory side and also from the funding side. So there's a lot more opportunities showing up and remote sensing has a really important play uh, piece to play in all of this. Um, so that's largely what we're gonna be focused on is you know, taking the pers perspectives from the panel that we have today, um, making this a relatively casual conversation, but just starting to think about how the different players uh, in remote sensing um, you know, can push us towards a more sustainable future. So the first question I'll start off with, um, actually, before I jump into it, I just want to mention that um, we're also open to having questions coming from the audience. So if you have any questions, you can pop them in the chat. And then if we have time, we'll uh, get to them towards the end of the chat. We're planning on taking this until the end of the hour. So um, looking forward to seeing any questions that the, the um, audience has. So to, to start this all off, I think it's kind of an interesting question because we have you know, this wide range of folks from across the remote sensing industry. Um, you're all working on key components of the sustainability ecosystem using remote sensing. Um, this spans hardware development, software development, nonprofits, governmental organizations, and academia. Um, can each of you tell us a little bit more about what you're working on and how it fits into the ecosystem? Um, we'll start with you, Caitlin, that's all right. Sure, that's, that sounds good. Thanks, Cooper. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Caitlin Conjus. As Cooper said, I'm the head of science at Impact Observatory. Um, previously, I was at Descartes Labs for five years. And before that, I got my PhD in geography from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Um, the common thread throughout my career has been using satellite imagery to map land cover and land use. And most recently, that culminated in a global 10 meter land use land cover map that my team at Impact Observatory created in partnership with Esri and Microsoft and was freely released by Esri this past June. Um, I'm super excited to be on this panel and I want to thank Cooper, Rose, and Subit for having me and GRSS generally for hosting it. Um, as Cooper said, this is a really timely topic uh, for all the reasons he stated, but also this decade is absolutely critical for addressing climate change. And it's, you know, this isn't a vague or abstract thing. It's a reality that's already wreaking havoc across the globe. Every morning you read about some new horror story with wildfires, flooding, extreme heat, failing crops, you name it. Um, remote sensing, I don't need to tell this group, is obviously a really useful tool for monitoring our changing planet. And the geospatial community has done amazing work over the years to address uh, different sustainability issues. But I'd argue that we all need to do better than we have been to meet this moment. And I include myself in that, of course. Uh, but for this panel, I've been reflecting on how we could maybe do that. And I have, you know, three key ideas. Uh, number one, I think we need to go beyond shared goals and have shared mandates. So collaboration becomes effective 
when solving a specific problem becomes a very concrete and non-negotiable part of everyone's job. So we need actionable mandates that are measurable, shared by all, and have consequences if we don't meet them. Um, we also need to start with the problem and not the tech. So too often in tech, I think we get wowed by the, the coolest new algorithm, um, but instead we need to start focusing on what we're trying to solve and create the simplest product that will be easy for folks to adopt and have the maximum impact. And finally, we need to get data out there faster because frankly, we can't afford to wait. Perfect is often the enemy of good in my experience and we need to release work out into the wild rather than trying to make it as perfect as possible. Solutions don't have to be perfect, they need to be useful and we need to get to them faster. So I'm excited to be on this panel with everybody today and talk about this and, and other ideas over the course of the next hour. Um, and yeah, back to you, Cooper. Yeah, it's great to have you here, Caitlin. Um, I think you know a common thread in your career also is you know working with a lot of academics turned industry researchers. There might be some academics you know joining us today. Do you have any thoughts on the biggest differences between you know working in the academic sector on sustainability related issues and how that is it you know changed on moving into industry? Uh, yes, I have, a, I have a lot of thoughts on that, and probably more than there's time for. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think. There are a lot of differences, but there's also a lot of common threads, which has been sort of an interesting transition for me from academia to uh, industry. The you know I went from my PhD to Descartes Labs, and for me, you know the what I would always say about that transition is you still get to work with like super smart. The reason I would have stayed in academia was to work with super smart people, work on cool cutting edge research, uh, and that all happens in industry. You just you know you it moves quite a bit faster, I would say, and you are less. Uh, hamstrung by funding needs, which is one benefit to industry. Yeah, totally. Um, thanks, Caitlin. Uh, I think next we'll probably go to Dan. Um, could you tell us a little bit more your work, a little bit more about what you're working on and how it fits into the, the ecosystem? Yeah, um, I am not as, as, as organized as Caitlin, so I'm going to try to shock and awe with links in the chat here. Hopefully you don't pay attention to me, but instead browse the internet while I talk. But uh, I'm, the, I'm the managing partner of a nonprofit, basically digital agency for the environment. So we build out um, uh, sort of the full stack of, uh, of environmental data for other environmental organizations. Uh, so that ranges from like the raw data manipulation to the algorithms to even the marketing materials after the front end has been built. Um, the, so, you know, one particular, I put in a couple of projects that have either been released recently in the last week or, um, or one that I'm particularly proud of, but we got our start in uh, journalism or supporting journalists in with uh, Earth Observation. Um, this started about four years ago, right after the Obama administration. I was the senior policy advisor for data infrastructure in the Obama White House. And when we came back, we started to sort of parse through old user logs um, that we had seen from building Global Forest Watch, which is a, um, a project to monitor deforestation from satellite imagery, and noticed that there were these spikes of usage when the data was used uh, uh, to help contextualize uh, or, or validate um, humanitarian or environmental events. So, you know, just about 3,000, at the time about 3,000 people per day hitting the site, and every so often there'd be a a spike at around 30 or 45,000 people that would come to the site when someone from a large publication would, would use the data um, and, and explain why when pixels light up on a screen, it, it matters to, to people. And so we just started to try to close the loop between people who already created content commanded audience like environmental journalists and the data themselves. And we did that for a few years uh, and it sort of informed everything that we've done since then. Um, where we, we end up focusing more on the, our comparative advantage in this space, this sort of broad and getting broader ecosystem, uh, is that is the digital product. So the, the UI, the UX, the design, um, uh, and making sure that, that that digital product, that those specs actually inform even all the way down to the infrastructure or the, um, the creation of the algorithms. Um, uh, so uh, a good a, a good example of the work that was done is is building the front and back end for Climate Trace, which is Al Gore's new project to monitor emissions from satellite imagery that was released last week. 
Earthrise is not responsible for the, for the data creation. But once that data is created, how do you start to work with that information in a way that, um, that you know, a program officer at the UN or you know, uh, a, a, a project manager in the Ministry of the Environment in Costa Rica, how, how do you actually start to, to work with that information for monitoring and reporting on, the, uh, on, on emissions? Um, and um, uh, but the idea is, is that everything is, is sort of uh, done with an eye towards people who would actually start to, to use and interact with it. And um, we started out just pure data science. And we could say that a little bit with impunity because no one really knows what that means. But our working definition uh, within Earthrise is that, is that it's the practice of identifying and then communicating patterns from within data. Uh, we spoke focus on Earth observation because it's a st data structure that we sort of understand and are fluent in. Um, but we have found our, our place in the communication side, so the downstream side. So beyond just visualization of that data, but the interaction with it. Um, and that came from sort of informed by the, uh, the experience of banging our heads against environmental journalism for a couple of years. I'll stop there. That's great to hear, Dan. I think, you know, similar to finding incentives from each of these different players in the space, it's also important to have, you know, stories that connect folks that people can actually see, you know, what these collaborations um, look like and how, you know, there ends up being an end result out of them. So, yeah, very excited to see, see all your work on that. Um, Inbal, can we hear from you about your background, uh, what you're working on now, and, and how it fits in the ecosystem? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks, Cooper and everybody. It's um, great to, to be on this panel. Um, my name is Inbal Bekaresha. As Cooper said, I'm the director of the NASA's program on food security and agriculture called NASA Harvest. Um, my background is in remote sensing and soil science and, and, and agriculture, actually. Um, and NASA Harvest is, as I said, NASA's food security and agriculture program. It's relatively new. It was launched in 2017. Um, and what's unique about it is, is it's quite an experimental program for NASA as it's run out of University of Maryland. So I'm based at University of Maryland um, rather than at NASA headquarters. And the reason for that was they wanted to try something new, something that would be more agile, more flexible, and be able to have more impact. And particularly thinking also about partnerships and recognizing that if we are to make an impact in this space, we needed to be able to partner easily with governments or with private sector or UN and, and humanitarian organizations. Um, and our main objective is really to increase the uptake and the use of satellite data to help inform a whole host of agricultural decisions, whether that's to do with more transparent agricultural commodity markets, um, humanitarian decisions, uh, and sustainability with a, a large focus also on, on, on sustainable agriculture. Um, we are an applied sciences program, and what that means is that essentially every project or every activity that we have is end user driven. And I think that's really important because I think oftentimes there are so many great products that are developed on the remote sensing side and, and developed on the academic side. Um, and then we sit there and we say, well, why aren't these being used to inform various decisions? And I think part of really what we need to be doing is it's not enough to create great products, even if they're scientifically rigorous. And if they're not guided by an end user and that end user is not part of that development and, and has ownership of that, you know, a government's not gonna say, great, you developed a you know, great yield map for me. Now I'm gonna make decisions based on that. They really have to be involved in that from, from the beginning. And so that's a really large focus for uh, our, our program and, and our activities. Um, specifically on the, the sustainability side, we have a large focus on building the evidence basis for adoption of sustainable and regenerative agricultural practices. We have a, a new initiative um, called Sarah, that's led by uh, Dr. Alyssa Whitcraft on that. And the idea there is really trying to bring together industry and academia in a pre-competitive forum to start to develop these kinds of, to answer these kinds of questions, to start to think about how do we do that? What are the key um, questions that we have? Which practices work best where? How can we scale the remote sensing and, and advance methods and, and monitoring? Um, in addition, we have quite a lot of different bilateral activities with different kinds of partners in, in this space, whether it's working with um, companies that, that are looking at soil moisture sensors, for example, and trying to understand how do we interpolate between those for informing irrigation uh, decisions. Um, to I, We've got an, a, a new initiative looking at insurance, for example, and looking at how do we use agricultural insurance to incentivize sustainable practices and, and whether or not that's a feasible solution and, and, and something that 
um, that ultimately makes sense on the insurance side. I think um, I was very surprised to learn that in fact insurance right now today, agricultural insurance actually does not account for sustainable practices. And so looking at, can we develop the evidence basis for, for encouraging that? Um, we work with different farmer associations like the Illinois Corn Growers Association, again, and, and looking at different management practices and helping to inform those um, using satellite data. So um, maybe I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks. Yeah, super important. Yeah, uh, super important, I think, on that pre-competitive note. I think, and you know, we chatted as well a, a little bit about um, getting ground truth data to make sure that you're verifying results. How important is that pre-competitive approach to getting the ground truth? I think it's, it's critical. I think we've got to be um, really creative about how do we make the case for mutually beneficial ways to share data and, and in particular the ground truth data. So I think we all are aware today that there's so, so much data, so many different tools and, and cloud computing and processing that anybody can, you know, not anybody, but you know, essentially a lot more people today can produce different products. And I think the key there is to make sure that those products are validated, that they're correct that we know the uncertainty around those. And of course the, the ground data is key both in developing those um, and then also in providing the uncertainty and, and the validation of those. And I think there, if we can think about it more in a pre-competitive space, if, if for example, a key product is looking at um, tillage practices, right? If, if different companies all shared their data and then they're all working off of that same baseline and using the same product and that's validated and they've all contributed to, then perhaps that's a way to, to, to move um, forward and, and to agree on where everybody benefits it's ultimately from, from being able to share that data. And if you share yours, you get a lot of other data coming in from, from, um, from other companies or partners as well. Yeah, very interesting to kind of be hearing from each of these different folks about you know, different ways to start building these relationships um, across you know, different sectors. Um, let's kind of wrap, let's wrap it up with you, Joe. Um, can you talk to us about your background, what you're working on and uh, how you fit into the ecosystem? Yeah, thanks, Cooper. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this panel. It's an honor. My fellow panelists are legends, <laughs> experts in remote sensing and climate science, sustainability, and the intersection of the two. I'm, I'm not an expert in either of those things, uh, so I'm kind of rounding out the panel here. Um, but what I have a lot of experience in is the pain of buying commercial satellite imagery, which is often a prerequisite to doing some of those really great applied sciences work that, that um, my fellow panelists talked about. And so I got the opportunity recently to join a company, Umbra, which is a space technology company. Our first product is a synthetic aperture radar satellite that can produce lots and lots of very high resolution X-band uh, SAR data. And our mission is to make it as simple to task a satellite as it is to book a hotel room online. And we believe that when we accomplish that goal, that will unlock a tremendous amount of opportunity for folks like people joining this call who know how to apply that data to solve real problems in the world. Um, so I, I would say that I fit into, your question was about the ecosystem more broadly and where we fit in. I'm very much on the, what some people call the upstream side or the infrastructure side. So we're designing hardware, we're manufacturing satellites we're launching them into space. We have one satellite that we launched earlier this year and a bunch more queued up to go as we move forward. Um, and our mission kind of stops at producing really high quality data. From there, we have to partner with really smart people who know how to apply that data to solve problems, especially problems related to climate change of which there are a million to choose from. Um, and so, yeah, my challenge to the audience today would be to look for opportunities to go very deep and very narrow on one specific problem to, to echo what Caitlin said, start with the problem, not with the solution, echo what Inbal said, um, be use case driven or end user driven in the work that you do. Let us worry about producing as much data as cheaply and, and openly as we can. Um, and you worry about how that it needs to be combined with five or 10 or 15 other data sets to come to some interesting insight that can be used to solve a problem or inform a decision. Um, that's where I fit in. So kind of upscale on the satellite and, and imagery production side, not so much on the applied side, but really excited to be part of this panel and, and discussing it. So thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to, to hear everyone's introductions. I think we you know, honed in on a few key pieces of, of where we think there are you know, benefits to collaborating, but I think at the same time, we've all been part of partnerships that haven't gone so well. Um, 
And a lot of times that's because there are different types of incentives that you know different actors have when when you're coming to together to do something as as a group. I think it'd be interesting maybe in this next section of the panel just to kind of go across each of the panelists and kind of hear what the top of mind incentives for kind of your current role or, or kind of current section of the ecosystem has um, and how that fits in with the other panelists. I guess, Dan, you're, you're in a nonprofit right now, so maybe you have the most leeway, but um, we should for you to start the conversation. Great, yeah, we have a lot of flexibility as both a nonprofit and effectively a service provider, right? I mean, our partnerships are pretty, pretty straightforward here where the, you know, we get handed a baton just like a contractor normally would. The reason why we're a nonprofit is because we, you, you know, uh, we exclusively focus on the environment in the service of our stated uh, and registered mission of getting many more eyes on earth change, um, sort of by any means necessary. Um, so more fluency in the way in which the, the earth is, is changing. And we use satellite imagery because it's a low cost, credible and compelling source uh, that's consistent across the globe. Um, so we end up leaning into specific applications that make best use of that and partners that are, are trying to, uh, to, to do that also. And, and one of, the, one, one of the, the particular features that we lean into is sort of cross country comparability. So we get comparability from direct observation, unlike you know, some of the issues associated with self-reporting of either um, natural capital or trash. So you know, in, in the Emerson or the, um, oh, it doesn't matter. The point being is, is that we're trying to measure either pollution or uh, sort of natural value. Um, and uh, a lot of times there's incentives across different countries or political boundaries in, in order to, um, I wouldn't say even mask, but just sort of selectively report or just change the way in which they report. And so having this direct observation in a consistent way offers this comparability. Um, and so we end up partnering as a service provider where, you know, whatever's needed, either from just the collection of the information, you know, interacting with people like Joe, uh, or uh, once the data has been processed, interacting with people like, um, like Andy Revkin at the New York Times, you know, to, to be able to get them the information that they need. So from sort of, um, you know, wh wherever, wherever in that value chain, but we end up being that service provider with deliverables. So it ends up being pretty straightforward. And since we're sort of mission driven, it's also pretty flexible uh, across, um, across contexts like agriculture or uh, emissions or monitoring plastics or whatever it, it ends up being where those sort of features of uh, satellite imagery and, and earth observation more generally are uh, especially uh, relevant. That answer the question. I sort of forgot. Yeah, I, I guess I'll I guess I'll jump to the other side of it. Is um, you know it sounds sounds like working in nonprofits just all rainbows. Um, what are the weaknesses of of being in a nonprofit, and why do you partner with you know specific folks um, to to move um, kind of sustainable solutions forward? Yeah, it's a really tough position because we end up doing the same work like on a day to day basis as we would do in like a large for-profit institution for which, um, you know, from standard nonprofits, you get paid six or seven times more. This is, was the downfall of the, actually early, early on, and they figured it out better since then, but the data lab at WRI, at one point we had the people who went on to be engineering managers at, for AI at Stripe. Uh, there's a wired profile of one of the guys uh, that quote, remade Twitter right after he left the data lab. We all sort of left because we were doing work for a nonprofit that we cared about and sort of building those first few versions of Global Forest Watch, uh, and then doing that same sort of work uh, at you know Twitter or Stripe or something like that and, and getting paid a lot more. And this isn't always about pay. I mean, like that wasn't the reason why we had started there in the first place, but it's it starts to sort of reflect sort of institutional value if you can't sort of double down on tech. And these aren't tech organizations, and but that's sort of what, what we do. And so we're, we're trying to find these sort of different models to sort of uh, uh, find and maintain talented people in a way that uh, is responsible so that they get paid like adults um, and do the good work. Maybe not paid like Google engineers, but paid like adults. 
Um, and, uh, and so this sort of service provider, nonprofit service provider, we're sort of straddling the line of nonprofit B Corp, I guess. I mean, there's no profits here. It's just trying to maintain sort of uh, the, the tech uh, team. But, um, but it's, it's a really tough place to be. So what's afforded is flexibility. What's not afforded is uh, money in quite the same way. Um, but um, but there's, there's room here, especially as there's, I mean, there, in just this past week, there's you know, massive announcements about investments in, in natural capital. Uh, from the white current white house there's all these incredible investments about public funding for these global public goods which should come from the public sector not you know climate tech vc in quite the same way and um and so there's interest and when there's interest and there's excess demand and right now there's excess demand and we're trying to ride that into impact or relevance yeah it sounds like there's a bit of a balance between you know per purpose and profits there, you know, trying to attract good talent, but also, you know, do interesting projects where everyone's excited about what they're working on. I know, Caitlin, that Impact Observatory is a for-profit company, but you also released this open source land cover map. Um, do you have any thoughts on this or kind of what the incentives are for, for your organization, um, both being able to do this kind of profit-driven research, but also, you know, have a for-profit-driven company? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, at a high level, you know, and like the the warm fuzzy North Star for us is to move the needle to, you know, help address some of these climate change issues. Um, but we are a for profit company. Uh, we're mission driven for profit company, So we're also uh, incentivized to earn some cold hard cash at the same time. Um, we've very much uh, situated ourselves at sort of the nexus between academia um, nonprofits and, uh, you know, non-governmental and governmental organizations and for-profit organizations. And so we work with, we work directly with, um, you know, experts in the field who are creating uh, different maps and models that require land cover maps. So we can provide them with updated land cover and then we can partner with them. So we're not trying to recreate the wheel. We're trusting their expertise to use our maps going forward. Um, we also work with folks like uh, the UN um, and so, you know, that's another partnership we have. And then we work with, you know, these massive organizations like Esri and Microsoft, and we're sort of in the middle, um, which is a fun place to be. And it's, it's really interesting to see different workflows and how we can sort of connect different groups together. At the same time, the incentives are, are quite different. So when we work with academics and um, we provide a land cover map, and then we'd like to, you know, leverage the method they're using to produce an output that we can then, you know, work with our commercial partners with, um, academics are incentivized to publish. So if there's a uh, months long process in peer review to get that out the door before it can then go into production, um, that isn't really the same sort of time scale that a lot of larger organizations are working with. Um, so we're in the first year at Impact Observatory. So we'll see how this plays out. So far, uh, we've been lucky, very lucky to partner with um, Microsoft on Esri, and Esri on a lot of the um, products that we've been developing. And so we, you know, as a small, what are we now? I think 20 person company, we wouldn't have the platform that we have if we didn't have those partnerships and to be able to distribute, you know, something on Esri's Living Atlas or Microsoft Planetary Computer, as opposed to just uh, us as, you know, a little new company trying to get this out in the world. Uh, it's been amazing to see the uptake of that. Uh, and yeah, we hope to, to develop that further, but a lot of it is sort of new and um, we'll see how it evolves as we go forward. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I think the kind of purpose and profit world just trying to merge a little bit more, especially when it comes to um, funders, you know, looking to fund companies that are mission driven. So um, yeah, it's gonna be exciting to see where, where that all goes in the next few years. Um, Joe, I guess similarly, I know you're kind of on the hardware side where you're thinking more about the pixels that are being sold. I know you have some thoughts about the incentive structures there, um, you know, selling it to people who might be able to make more money on intelligence versus sustainability. Do you have, do you want to share some of your thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think about incentives from both sides of the table. And I think one of the things I'm most proud of at Umbra is that We've done a good job at the outset of identifying how we can structure our business to have incentives that align with those of our customers, as opposed to 
more traditional business models in the satellite imagery industry. So to get specific, like building satellites is really expensive and launching them into space is really expensive. And then sometimes they fail and things go wrong in space and you have to kind of factor all that in when you raise money. And so you wind up raising a lot of money and then the expectations of return on that capital are really high. And that's why you see a lot of satellite imagery companies start their own analytics team, for instance. And the incentives of that analytics team, I mean, the reason you're starting it is because it's a new revenue stream for you. It's natural. Like you're capturing a lot of imagery about the earth and you're trying to turn that into intelligence and the margins on that intelligence product are much higher than the margins on the data tied to this hardware and launch and uh, maintenance that goes into these uh, constellations. The trouble is that every customer you win becomes a temptation. It's like, oh, uh, Dan came to us to support a global plastics watch. That's a really interesting use case. Um, there's a lot of demand for that. Why don't we give that use case to our analytics team? And then before you know it, you're competing with all your own customers. Uh, and that analytics team, God bless them, they'll never do as good a job as each individual person or, or customer that's just focused on that one problem. They're trying to boil the ocean. They have every use case across every industry. That's the blessing and the curse of satellite imagery is that it can be applied to so many different industries. So trying to do all of it at once while also kind of upsetting your own customer base at the same time, that was something that I was extremely wary of coming from the other side of that equation as someone that used to be buying satellite imagery and doing analysis and then seeing, I wouldn't call it copying, but seeing those sort of gross incentives play out. Um, so our, our business model is very simple. I didn't introduce us as a satellite imagery company. I said, we're a space technology company. And that was very intentional because satellite imagery is just the first product that we can build with the intellectual property we've developed, especially around the antenna design that we have and, and the power generation uh, technology that we have. Um, but so we're okay with being a manufacturer and having manufacturer margins and flooding the market with supply and seeing what kind of amazing things people can build on that and not competing with them. Um, but yeah, you have to think very carefully about incentives, especially in this, in this world and, and be careful about who you partner with. Um, because at the end of the day for for-profit companies, sustainability has a very different connotation to us. We're thinking in terms of sustainability of the business as in make more money than you spend. And we are spending a lot of money to build this infrastructure. So we have to make a lot of money uh, to cover our costs. So yeah, it, it's something that I hope in the future, I mean, it's not just Umbra, there's a wave of new satellite imagery providers that have a very different attitude and orientation towards what their business model should be. It's much friendlier to the folks doing the really valuable work, applying it to very particular applications. And I've honestly never been more optimistic about what the future of the industry looks like. So um, I'm not taking all the credit for it. There's, there's a bunch of great companies getting started right now. So, um, but we still are gonna need people to turn that data, which there's gonna be an absolute trove of it uh, into solutions that actually solve real problems. So um, yeah, incentives definitely play a big part in, in my own career and, and in the industry in terms of uh, satellite imagery providers partnering with and sometimes competing with their own customers. Yeah, and it's, it's an ongoing conversation across the industry. So obviously we're not going to you know, solve it here, but it's interesting to hear from you know everyone's own mouths of exactly what what they're thinking about. Um, Inbal, I wonder if you can just briefly talk about you know some of the incentives that you're running into at NASA Harvest, and I know you've had a few kind of partner. Um, partnerships go really well. And, and if you have any examples of that, we excited to hear about how those worked and, and what made those partnerships go really well. Sure. Um, I think again, on, on a very high level where Harvest comes from and why we're, we're motivated, I think, um, you know, we have 2 billion more people to feed by 2050. I think if we look at the SDG goal of zero hunger, we're just getting further and further away from that. Um, and I think, food security is probably one of the biggest challenges that we're facing right now in this century, and especially with more extreme uh, weather events and, and increased conflicts. And so that's really where Harvest is coming from and recognizing that there's so much more potential still that satellite data can offer to really help inform a lot of decisions that can help save lives, that can help um, inform more sustainable practices. Uh, so on a very broad picture, that's, you know, that's where we're coming from. We're obviously a, a, um, a NASA program. 
Um, although our funding is not just NASA, so we, we, we do have a lot of different sources of funding that, that come into, um, into NASA Harvest. But going more into, I guess, you know, how do we make partnerships work and recognizing that partnerships are, are core for everything that we're, we do. Um, and I think going back to one of the questions that you asked in terms of one of the, you know, one of the things that, that we really need more of to help improve and to help really continue to unlock the potential for satellite data is ground data. And, and I saw one of the comments talking about ground truth and I agree ground truth is, you know, it's not always truth, obviously, um, but it is really important for, for, for everything that we do. And if we think again about um, the sustainability question or about looking at, uh, practices and if we're trying to help inform different practices and for example, um, you know, how well, it, where does no-till work best under which crops, under which cropping conditions. If we don't have those data sets, the long-term data sets too, because we also know that if you switch today to different sustainable practices, that's not gonna have the results next year, right? That might be 10 years down the road and, and it might be only under an extreme event that you really see some of the, the, the benefits from that. So. A lot of what we're trying to do is improve our, our methods and, and models, whether that's from you know, the basics of cropland and crop type mapping to yield forecasting and, and yield estimation um, to management practices. And, and you know, often a lot of times you'll hear, well, the main bottleneck is the ground observations. Um, and so I think what we're trying to do is think about how do we, and, and a, lot of, a lot of that data does exist, right? So a lot of that data exists in the private sector and, and, and in industry. And what we're trying to figure out is how do we better partner with industry? How do we look at the different incentives that we have versus what, what they have? And, and some of our successful partnerships have been, we have one with a um, South American company that's essentially a scouting service for, for farmers. Um, and they've got a lot of data on yield and on, um, and on crop type, map, uh, for example. And so while we don't have an exchange of funding, what we do have is that they've shared their um, data with us. We've been able to adapt and improve our yield models and have integrated that then into their services that they provide. And so they've gotten out of us, I guess, a lot of analytics and expertise and, and use of satellite data for agriculture and for, for yield. And we've been able to improve our yield models, which initially we've developed based on, on crop statistics, which are free and available, but those are at the you know, at best at, you know, subnational scale, whether that's a county or a state or oblast or, or what have you. Um, so, you know, another example is um, we worked with, uh, with Swiss Re, for example, we, where we both co-funded a, a fairly large um, data collection in, in Ukraine. Um, we were able to get a much better uh, price, for example, for that data to be collected because it's a partner that Swiss Re has. Um, that they had an incentive to, to you know, if, if we on our own would have gone and made that contract, my guess is that it would have cost us probably the double. Um, and so they were interested on their side and looking at how can satellite data help improve the efficiency and, and the, the cost effectiveness of, of um, their payout schemes. Um, and on our side, again, we were very interested in continuing to increase our understanding and our models for, for yield forecasting in, in particular. Um, and so I think that's another great example of looking at how do we incentivize and, and make these, um, you know, I think we have different ones where it's not necessarily an exchange of, of funding, but, but different ways of looking at how do we both get something out of that partnership. Yeah, yeah, it all makes, it makes a lot of sense. I, it's kind of funny, you know, I'm talking about, you know, partnerships and, and collaboration. I'm all, you know, asking you all questions in, in isolation. So maybe and for the next 20 minutes, we can open up, you know, more discussions that, you know, have more interaction between all of you. I think um, an interesting question to that effect is, you know, the sustainability space is moving pretty quickly right now. Um, are any of you worried that's moving too quickly and that kind of we're going to get in front of our skis on what we can promise and, and what we can actually say in terms of, of what remote sensing can do? Um, how do we guard against that? And do partnerships have a place to play um, to, you know, protect us from that that future? Does anyone want to jump in um, for first comments on that? Yeah, I I can jump in here because I, I don't, we sort of are living in that future and have been for a little while, and it's like more as it becomes easier to interact with this data, which is great. Uh, the lower the cost of entry for new science. There's also a lot more half-baked science uh, that are sort of that's driven by the constraints of the ways that the, the platforms that you can use to interact with these data. And so there's like this 
this proliferation, and this has been the case for a really long time, of these wall-to-wall -wall data sets that are precise everywhere, but accurate nowhere. That is, there's a number for every place or, you know, how many uh, everywhere in the world. But if, so, uh, but if you uh, try to aggregate it anything below like a, a county level or something, even that's a stretch sometimes, then you get errors that are, you know, six or seven times, 600, 700% errors for a lot of these numbers. Uh, whereas you might be able to get 15 or 20% errors if you aggregate to the country level for these types of the, the you know, wall-to-wall -wall data sets. And so one of the, one of the ways I think to, to, to combat this issue, which is really good for sort of like taking a broad temperature of like what's changing on, on the earth, but it's, it falls short of being able to actually change and, uh, decisions or manage natural assets. Is, is I think twofold. One is to develop the tools to more meaningfully interact with the information that's within the, the raw imagery. So it's not so much getting someone an answer, but the, the capability to assemble evidence about earth change. So that's, that's one. Um, and I forgot the other one, but, uh, but, but there, it's really tempting to sort of like say, all right, well, let's, let's find some correlations here. Um, and, uh, and pub and publish that without sort of getting, uh, you know, it's it's not a matter of intellectual honesty. It's just sort of like a, an awareness of what the limits of the uh, the data are, um, given the uh, sort of inherent uncertainties. Um, well, oh yeah, what, and another thing is to sort of start also working on things that you can see that you can validate from satellite imagery. So you can't you can't see. Uh, carbon, for example, from satellite imagery, from like, uh, you know, uh, you can sort of do correlations with above ground biomass, or you can't see poverty from sat satellite imagery. You can start to see some proxies of the two, um, but you can't see it directly, whereas you can see trees getting removed. And there are some big issues. And when I say that, I'm sure there's like a million people who would say, oh, you can't see deforestation, you can see forest cover loss and stuff like that. But the idea being is, is that it's a little bit more uh, the, the change is a little bit more self-evident. So even just leaning into the um, inventorying the things that we can see at global scale, um, that would sort of help with some of these precise everywhere but accurate nowhere data sets. Yeah, I would just, um, to follow that thought a little bit, the thing I'm probably most worried about, it's not that we're moving too fast, but the, but the crisis on the horizon is that we have a bit of a sequence problem where there's this binary uh, inflection point that is coming in the next few years that I couldn't be more excited about where one day you will just be able to buy high resolution imagery of wherever you want and you'll be able to afford it as an individual. And it's a binary moment because as soon as one provider enables that, it puts a ton of compre uh, competitive pressure on the others to enable that. Right now, it's you know hearing stories like the one Imbal you just told about needing to partner with a massive reinsurer to get a good deal from a satellite imagery provi provider. That's like the definition of an inefficient market. Like there should just be one posted price, one license for everybody. Do what you want with it and sort of unlock the potential of the market. That day is coming, and I'm very excited about that. That's what in my career I'm 100% focused on ushering in that era. The trouble is that once you cross that binary threshold, who's going to do all stuff with all that data? There's like not enough remote sensing expertise to metabolize all that data, let alone the people you need to partner with who can produce that on the ground intelligence and understand the context of the communities that you're measuring from space. That's a whole separate problem. So the reason I say it's a sequence problem is that how much can you invest in that ahead of being able to get the data to enable those use cases, just waiting around for that moment to come versus once the moment comes, retrospectively trying to catch up and invest a lot in it right then. And then for the satellite imagery providers who need to make it up on volume to make the business model work, you know, it's sort of a lot of waiting for the market to mature. And so there's a bit of a timing problem. And that's why I'm really excited by opportunities for public private partnership, where a lot of the value in this data is not monetizable. It's like public good. It's, it's stuff that doesn't have monetary value, but it has a tremendous amount of value. So public institutions partnering with private groups who've invested private capital into this infrastructure can bridge that gap. 
And if we make it to the other side, then there's going to be an explosion of entrepreneurship and creativity that happens. But certainly we are rushing towards that moment as fast as we can. And you see in the news every day, another billion dollars going into a special purpose acquisition company, you know, to, to take a new space company public. I think there's going to be a bit of a crunch period where the market hasn't materialized as fast as we hoped. And I think we're going to need some help to make it through there. But once we make it through, a lot of really good things will happen. Um, that, that's what I think about over the next, I would call that like a five to 10 year horizon for, for, for my seat anyway. And I mean, I think that we have seen so much uptake and so many kind of products being developed on top of different data sets. And in, in particular, if you think about the, again, the sustainability space, but not only companies coming out and saying, okay, we can do yield forecasts better than um, whatever, you know, government agency or, or organization. And I think we've got to be really careful about that. Um, because I think if you, I think there has been a lot of over promise on the remote sensing side. I think there are a lot of exciting things, but I think at the same time, if we're not careful and we say we can, you know, monitor every yield of every field around the world with 90% accuracy, um, and then that's just going to backfire because people, especially when you're thinking about end user organizations that are going to start to use that and when it doesn't meet their needs and when it, you don't actually deliver on that, um, then people are going to say, I can forget, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to use, I've, you know, heard about remote sensing and, and I'm not going to use it. And so I think there has been a lot of, there's been a lot of great stuff and I think we've been evolving quickly, but I think there is also been a lot of over promise in terms of what we can do. And I think part of it is, is being honest is providing the uncertainty around our data and, and what we can and can't do today. And, you know, perhaps we will be able to do that in the future. And, and part of it is if there's no transparency in, in the data sets or in the validation or in how the products were made or what the, the, the data that went into these models or into these products, um, I, think, I think that's something that we have to get better at is sharing the code, sharing the data, sharing kind of what works and, and what doesn't work so that we can all learn also from each other and from each other's mistakes. There's no point in each organization, each company kind of developing their own approaches rather than building on top of, of each other. I think that ultimately will benefit everybody, public and, and private. Yeah, and Imbal, that goes back to what you were saying about making sure there's conversations with the end user before a product is developed. And, you know, um, you know I think focusing on the outcome instead of just some cool new algorithm or technology is so important and you know building off of what's already done i feel like there's a lot of reinventing the wheel in the geospatial industry where there's one model and you know maybe a group of experts but then a private company wants to create something starting from scratch so that they own the ip and it's proprietary um and i i think the you know more collaboration that can happen between these you know different experts in the academic fields and um, industry and end users the better uh Cooper, to your original question about do we, do I worry if we're going too fast? Um, I actually worry about the opposite, uh, as I was saying earlier. I mean, I think it's it's so critical that we address, you know, there's so many problems and like we don't have time to just like sit back and and like iterate internally to, you know, before we release something. I think there's a balance between maintaining scientific integrity and um, you know, communicating all the limitations, providing as many ancillary data products as you can to, uh, so the end users can use the products appropriately and um, you can communicate what their use case is. But I think, you know, we, you know, we don't want to be putting out junk science, but we also need to like get stuff as long as it's useful and it's moving the needle uh, and is something that isn't out there and could be useful. We should be putting it out there, collaborating with other folks, communicating any limitations and, you know, just like fully focused on what these problems are that really need to be solved immediately. Yeah, it gets down to the kind of standards and transparency piece of, you know, a lot of scientists on this call, you wanna make sure you're doing good science as well as solving an applied problem and making sure that you have that transparency so that everyone um, you know, knows the assumptions that go into that product. I think related to that question and, you know, also the fact that we're in an IEEE session I also wonder if folks on this call have any thoughts on kind of the role of standards bodies or publishing organizations are on encouraging these organizations. Obviously, we can bring you all together for an awesome chat like this today. Um, but do you also see uh, additional roles for, for these types of organizations in, in bringing these collaborations together? Well, 
I can say one. I mean, I think obviously we have to maintain high standards in terms of publishing. Um, I think we have to require if you're going to publish a map, then that map needs to be publicly available. It can't just be in the paper and, you know, look at my accuracies and my, you know, I think you've got to at least that, if not also the data and the code and everything else that goes behind it. We need to be moving towards that. But the other side, I think, is we need to encourage more publications that are not just focused on high innovation and new algorithm or new method or, you know, something really cutting edge on the science side. Um, I think if we're really trying to make an impact and, and move towards applications, then, then we need to make sure that we're also publishing more on that transition from science into operations and the implications of that and the challenges of that or the lessons learned from that. Um, I think, you know, there isn't enough of that. And I, I see a lot of papers being rejected from high kind of uh, visibility or uh, publications because, you know, because they're not cutting edge enough or not innovative enough. And in, instead, I think we would all benefit from being able to publish on that and to being able to really move this forward if there was a more focus also on applied science, um, more so than, than there is at the moment. I would say that the, the opportunity that IEEE and similar organizations have, apart from just standards, is network and community. Uh, I sometimes tell a story about when my parents dropped me off at college and my dad turned to me and said, it's, it's not what you know, it's who you know, and your mother and I don't know anyone, and then they left. And I think about that a lot because every good thing that's happened in my life has happened because of participation in some community. And I think the challenge that's ahead of us in terms of climate change, predicting it, mitigating it, reacting to the effects of it is so enormous, you, you can't do it alone. And so I would look at the other people that show up to talks like this and think about what you could build together with them, especially if they're coming from a different research background or a topic area that you don't understand as much. Because um, I think there's gonna be a real crisis of creativity in, in this space where the data will be there and finding ways to leverage it to solve problems is gonna take a lot of effort from a lot of people collaborating. Um, so certainly, and Bob, I love what you said about keeping the standards high. Um, and I hope that that acts as a filter, but that there's a lot of stuff to filter. It's not like people just feel like, oh, I, I don't wanna like try something because it might fall short of, um, you know, the expectations that this amazing community has for what research needs to be. Try some stuff, try to get some stuff published. If you get rejected, read the comments and figure out, take that feedback and don't take it as a negative thing, take it as an opportunity. Um, and yeah, and to the, the organizers of this webinar today, thank you for organizing this conversation. I hope that it starts a lot of similar conversations among the attendees. Um, and yeah, now's the time. There's not a whole lot of time left to prepare. Like the data is coming, the crisis is here. So we got to start building some solutions to, to some of these problems. And the best people to do it with are the ones that voluntarily show up to events like this and, and want to learn about it and, and spend their time on it. So that's another role that I feel like community building is something that IEEE is uniquely suited to do. Um, and, and I hope to see more of in the future. Yeah, I see that. Oh, go ahead, Caitlin. Go ahead, Cooper. I was just going to say, I see we're coming up on time. So I think, you know, my, right now might be a good time to kind of end on a on a high note. I know we didn't get to many of the questions, so I'm sorry about that from the, uh, the panelists, but one came up that I think is maybe a good one to, to end on that you know, each of the panelists can answer is, you know, where do you think the real value add in the geospatial industry is right now for sustainability? Um, you, know, you can use this as a time to plug what you're working on, you know, something that you're really excited about, or just, you know, generally the kind of overall excitement that the entire industry has right now um, towards sustainable solutions. Um, but maybe just one or two sentences from, from each of you on what you're excited about. Don't everyone jump at once. Um, yeah, I mean, Joe mentioned that there's gonna be an inflection point where suddenly there's just a ton of data um, that, you know, high resolution, it's affordable. I saw somebody in the chat also mention this, so I will date myself for a moment. And when I started in remote sensing, Landsat was also not free. It was $4,000 for a scene. Um, and then, you know, quickly after NASA released the archive of data, there was suddenly this influx of papers in the literature about um, change detection and time series um, analysis. And it was like 
overnight that happened. And I think it's going to be a similar thing where there's just, there's so much data and there's going to be so many insights to be had from that data and things that, you know, we haven't, couldn't even fathom when I started, like global high resolution hyperspectral is coming out of Satellogic. Um, there's, you know, high resolution global SAR from places like Umbra. I mean, uh, when L-band SAR comes out, that's going to be incredible uh, to use. And so I think, um, I don't know that I'm really answering your question, Cooper, but that's what I'm most excited about for the future of the geospatial industry. And um, I don't actually worry about there being a crisis of creativity, uh, like Joe mentioned. I think there's a ton of creative people and that collaboration will be important so that we aren't reinventing the wheel. But, um, you know, I started this panel on sort of like a cynical note that we're not doing enough or we need to do more. And, you know, panels like this are fill me with so much optimism because there are so many smart people and there's so much happening in the industry that is different from, you know, when I got into it 15 years ago. So, um, so yeah, I'll end on a positive note after starting on a, on a cynical one. So for me, there's a, there's private value and there's social value. Uh, and so the private value I think is more sort of this data enabled consultants. That's where I think most of the, the value that being able to capture the value has come from. Um, with, uh, but for the social value, I'm, I'm really excited about sort of what's to come because there was a, a wave of organizations working on climate risk. So assuming climate change, what happens to certain assets sort of, but you sort of have, but part of that is assuming that we're not gonna be able to change very much. And we're just trying to figure out the, the least cost or uh, way in which to deal with it, least pain way in which to deal with it. But with higher resolution imagery and more uh, meaningful ways in which to interact with that observation, I think we can start to switch. And we are seeing that switch right now in the last, you know, even just year uh, toward climate mitigation, uh, which is ways in which to, you know, naturally uh, sequester carbon or, um, or, or even beyond uh, climate change, uh, you, you know, being able to plan and use uh, natural capital in the place of uh, built or human built constructed um, infrastructure. Um, and I think that, that, that a lot of those questions, because they're much more subtle and hyper local, do require this sort of the new innovations in data and, um, and interactions. And, uh, and so I'm really excited about that next phase where, you know, uh, instead of working uh, with insurance uh, as much as we have, which is important, um, we can start to also work with um, with uh, institutional investors uh, uh, that uh, it, you know, opening up more markets here that would help with um, climate mitigation rather than adaptation. I guess I can uh, jump in. I think if we look even like what we were able to do five years ago where we were in this space versus where we are today, it's, you know, it's kind of really revolutionized everything in terms of what we can do. And, um, you know, from the data sets themselves and, and, you know, whether that's coming from the Sentinels or from constellations, you know, like, like Planet or, you know, kind of even new things that are coming up like Umbra or, you know, um, constellations for, for precipitation or whatever. I mean, I think there, you know, that so much is, is changed in terms of the availability of the data. Um, and also our ability to, to turn that into information and, and in terms of cloud computing and, and really access to this kind of information. And I think, um, and what that's done is also it's helping to start to break down some of the silos between the, you know, the, the remote sensing community and those that can really be using and uptaking this kind of information. And, and I think um, we're really seeing, at least from, from our side from, from Harvest, and, and I should also say from, from the GeoGlam side, from the, the GEO's initiative on, on, on global agriculture monitoring, is just a humongous amount of, of requests for, for more information, for more data. I think we're going to see more and more requests for rapid assessments and analysis in, in response to, to climate and response to extreme events or um, policy changes. And, and I think the more awareness that there is, the more innovation there's going to be, the more partnerships there are for really being able to unlock the, the potential for, for satellite data. I mean, I think we've you know, been talking about it, at least in the agricultural space since the seventies about what this technology can do. And I think we're finally now in the place where, where it can do it. And we have the tools, we have the data, we have what's needed to actually make it, um, make it happen. And, and I think we need to continue to, and I completely agree in terms of cooperation and collaborations. And this panel is wonderful. And, and I think 
more, you know, the more we can do that with, with the policy communities, with economic communities, with industry, with, with whoever. I think it, it takes long-term commitment and, and trust and building those kinds of relationships to be able to, to enable that. And, um, and I think, you know, we're, we're seeing more and more of that happening, which I'm very excited about. I'll try to be quick because I know I know we're at time, but uh, thank you again for hosting this panel. It's been a lot of fun. Um, I would say if I had to summarize where the opportunity is, uh, it's having a long term time horizon that you're focused on. It's like committing yourself for the long haul. Um, and I, I sometimes joke that a lot of these satellite imagery companies, they're like multi decadal missions measured in quarterly earnings. And so there's going to be tough times ahead when, you know, those ups and downs come. But if you can have a really, really long term horizon for your career and your research uh, that matches the scale of the problem that we're up against, you can have a competitive advantage against the folks that are focusing on the near term ups and downs who are distracted by that. Um, so that's where I would say the opportunity is, is find your people and uh, focus on the very long term and, and you'll be able to do something differentiated. Yeah, it's a testament to how exciting the sustainability space is right now to, to hear from all, all four of you all. I just want to thank all four of you for kind of coming and giving giving a chat in this panel discussion. It was incredibly exciting. I hope everyone who joined is just as excited as I am. Um, I also want to quickly thank the co-organizers, uh, Rose and Sue Beat, for helping organize this. This was uh, basically a, a panel of all stars, and we are excited to get you all, all in here, and, and they did an awesome job organizing. Um, I will just mention that this was the highest level panel that we're putting together. We also have two panels that are coming as follow-ups on more specific applications of remote sensing for sustainability. So, so keep your eyes open for that. And I hope everyone has a good afternoon. Thanks for coming. The last thing I wanted to say is we didn't get a chance to go into questions, but what we're going to do is tag people on Twitter, uh, Twitter and um, ask people questions directly on Twitter. And if you guys can answer there, so the participants can uh, find it on the GRSS Twitter account. Um, and also please follow the GRSS Twitter account. Um, yeah, thanks Cooper. Thanks Rose, thanks everyone.